Michigan. Rick Margolis, what were you doing in Washington, D.C. in the 60s and 70s? Well, I came to Washington in 1967 uh, after um, being drafted my senior year in college and applying for a conscience objector status and a non-traditional uh, religious objection, which was allowed and got guidance from this wonderful book uh, that was available at the time, a Handbook for Conscience Objectors from Philadelphia. And, um, and uh, I was initially turned down for the CO status. And I'm sure I was just one of thousands of young men across the country who were, were doing similar things. And um, uh, I w appealed uh, my rejection, came before the board in Philadelphia. And I remember uh, on the board was an African-American Baptist minister. Mm -hmm. And at one point he said, uh, now, Mr. Margolis, um, uh, do you believe in God? And I said, um, well, I believe in the power of love as a supreme being. And at this point he took his elbow and he pushed his coat aside to expose a large brass cross hanging from his belt as a way of signaling to me, uh, I was raised in a Jewish family, uh, he was signaling to me his religious authority mm -hmm. and that obviously he didn't agree that love had anything to do with a supreme being mm -hmm. because he held a traditional belief in God as some creator in the, in the clouds. And um, so I didn't expect much from that appeal, but it turned out I was granted conscience objector status. And I started serving in Jackson, Mississippi, uh, working for a um, layman's overseas service, which was a kind of an ecumenical Peace Corps. And um, I started um, serving there, working there, and and continued reading about the war in Vietnam, which was just uh, every day brought us news of, of greater atrocities. And I was reading an essay by A.J. Musty, an old pacifist writer in, in uh, New York. And uh, uh, he said in his essay, why would someone accept a comfortable berth in the ship of state when the ship of state is at war? And I didn't have an answer for that question. And uh, I realized he was speaking to me. I had a comfortable birth. I was a conscience objector. Mm -hmm. And yet there were young men my age dying uh, in the war. And uh, so I decided to return my draft card, which I did on Valentine's Day in 1967 and was fired immediately the next day. Uh, because the organization didn't want in Jackson, Mississippi, the specter of a draft dodger. Um, and so uh, I started uh, traveling to campuses, speaking against the war, and particularly advocating other young men to return their draft cards like I had. And um, started at Tougaloo, uh, uh, college, uh, African American college in Jackson and Mills um, in Jackson and continued on traveling and um, I let the draft board know what I was doing and that uh, they could contact me anytime you know if they wanted me to stop and uh, I continued and came in, into Washington and spoke at GW to a group and um, someone there invited me to come over and uh, meet people at the Institute for Policy Studies, which was really wonderful because suddenly I was with a group of people who, uh, who supported uh, the same things that were interesting me at the time. And I continued after I left Washington into New England speaking at colleges, but I remembered IPS mm -hmm. and I came back to Washington uh, in the fall of 1967 and uh, through the um, uh, affirmation and generosity of Mark Raskin, um, was invited to become part of the Institute. And I started living with a group of people on S Street uh, that fall. And, um, and uh, interested, I was interested in community, how people could 
young people could begin to live together communally and begin to um, uh, manifest a different way of living that was not materialistic, that was based upon sharing and equality of, of roles and, and work. And um, that was what I was talking about at the Institute for Policy Studies. Mm -hmm. And um, that summer, before I came back to Washington, I had um, uh, discovered a listing, which I still have, this 1967 Directory of Social Change, which, um, you know, this was well before the internet, when, you know, today we can just go on the internet and put in any question. Everything was printed then, and this was a listing of intentional communities around the country. And uh, an intentional community is where people choose to live communally out of some philosophical, religious, or political objective. And I thought it'd be really interesting to go and see these places and meet these people and learn from them. So I spent that summer traveling around the country and uh, went to many different places with different types of cultures. The most interesting, perhaps, was the, <clears throat> excuse me, the um, Hutterite community in Inkster, North Dakota. The Hutterites are, are Anabaptist communists, essentially. Um, Christians who live uh, according to the way they believe Jesus was asking them to live, which was to share everything. And it was a community of about 60, 70 people. Um, they had families and they had individual houses in this large uh, farm uh, that they had uh, of thousands of acres. Um, but the, the houses they lived in didn't have kitchens and they would come together and eat communally. And they were traditional people. They, they wore dark clothing uh, the women wore long peasant dresses. The women were responsible, including the young girls, for cooking the meals, and the men were responsible for going out in the fields and working on the land. And uh, that was just a fascinating experience because it was a real uh, community. It was a real kind of uh, uh, Christian communist community. Communal in the sense of communist, communal. And... Um, in any event, I came back to Washington in the fall with those ideas in my head. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that fall, uh, I was also, um, I was uh, sleeping in my room. One morning I heard a knock on the door, um, you know, um, yeah. woke me up. And I looked up. And the door opens up, and suddenly there are these two large men in business suits. And a voice says, Margolis, this is the FBI. We're coming in. And in came these two uh, young men, uh, each of them, you know, like linebackers in a football team. And uh, they said, OK, Margolis, get up. Well, I was sleeping. Uh, in a sleeping bag on a mattress on the floor. I was naked and I got up and I'm standing there. I weigh about 120 pounds. I'm naked and here are these two huge guys and they're looking at me and uh, they say, okay, Margolis, you're under arrest. And uh, they said, uh, okay, would you like to get dressed? I said, yes, that'd be nice. Uh, they said, wear your clothes. <clears throat> I said, well, they're in the closet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one of the men goes over to the closet and he pushes his coat back and revealing his gun on his belt. And uh, he very gingerly opens the door and looks in with his hand ready to take his gun out as if I had an accomplice with a weapon in the closet. I said, do you know why I'm being arrested? He said, yes you're refusing to cooperate with the draft and the selective service. I said, yes, because I refuse to carry a weapon. He said, well, we can't be too careful. I said, okay, okay. I mean, it, it's experiences like this that, that, that uh, 
show the, the contrast between the terrible things the government was doing and the kind of almost comical um, extent they would go to try to suppress protest. You said to me once that was uh, the trouble that they went to was probably a proof of that we were having some effect on them, that they were scared, worried about what we were doing. Yes, right. Yes. I mean, at some level, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I, a number of years ago, I, through the Freedom of Information Act, I, I requested my FBI file, which I looked over last night, and it, it just has some amazing things in it. I just want to, yes. if I could, just read you a couple things um, that relate to this. Um, one is, uh, there's a, a letter, it, this docu the, the document is, is mainly bureaucratic stuff, uh, you know, who they talk to, the dates they talk to them, etc. But all the interesting material, of course, is blacked out, you know, completely undermining the idea of freedom of information. So the information they give you is completely bureaucratic data that has no significance. But anything of any interest, of course, is eliminated. Um, and uh, so uh, in this document, it says a number of things. One of the things it says in the arrest record, it says the fugitive, that was me, was allowed to get dressed. I mean, it's comical. I mean, a, a dramatist could write this stuff and you would, you would see it and you'd think this is unbelievable. He was allowed to get dressed. Um, but there's a letter somewhere, if I could find it, that's signed by J. Edgar Hoover. Of course, that's probably, that's probably one of these signing machines. I don't think he would waste his time signing such a document. But it says, uh, I wish I could find it because it, describes me as a dangerous person. Um, oh, here's another thing that's very funny. In the record, in this FBI record, it says, no request is being made to interview Margolis at this time, as in the opinion of WFO, I, th that would be the Washington field office of the FBI, in view of his past activities such an interview could result in embarrassment to the Bureau. What? You mean I might say something that would be embarrassing to the Federal Bureau of Investigation? I mean, uh, the, the times were quite amazing. Just, um, my son, when he heard these, and daughter Amy, uh, when they heard these stories about the 60s, they just were laughing, but they also started digging up some old photographs just to see, and I thought I would just show you, it was, this was me in 1967, and um, it was this kind of look mm -hmm. that, of course, a lot of young people mm -hmm. looked like that, and, and I think this contributed yeah. to uh, the feeling that these young people were really dangerous, uh, had long hair tied in the back, you know, oh, and a beard, and... Um, even though I was a Gandhian and, um, you know, believed uh, in the power of nonviolence and they thought that, that I was uh, some threat to them. And, um, but in that, uh, you ask about the, the trial after I was arrested, uh, was held in jail just for a day and released on personal, person, personal recognizance and posted bail. Uh, but I got into court and uh, was represented by Mike Tiger, who had um, um, something called the Selective Service Law Reporter and was very helpful to people. Uh, there were thousands of us. I was a signer of the resistance statement uh, in which uh, we publicly said we wouldn't cooperate with the draft. And Mike was uh, just a, a prince in uh, helping us uh, deal with the Selective Service Law. And uh, in court, uh, in front of uh, Judge William uh, Bryant, who was um, uh, an appointee to the bench by President Johnson, uh, a liberal African-American uh, uh, judge who, um, when I was sitting in court, uh, 
uh, a case would come up, a poor African-American man would be brought in front of Judge Bryant and Bryant would listen and then he'd get impatient and he'd tap on the desk and he'd say, uh, Mr. Clark, he said, um, when you were in this uh, fight over the gambling, uh, did you have a weapon? Uh, and uh, Mr. Clark would say, uh, no, Your Honor, I did not. And Bryant would slam his gavel down and he'd say, uh, uh, six months probation. Next person would come up and he'd talk about how he'd gotten in a fight and everything and Brown would get, get impatient and he'd tap on the desk and he'd say, excuse me, say, uh, Mr. Jackson, did you have a weapon? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I had a knife. Bryant would go, all right, two years jail. You know, and he very clearly, he had a, a strong um, a bias against weapons. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was very lenient with people who committed crimes that did not have weapons. And here I was um, refusing to carry a weapon. Uh, but I had broken a federal law, which is a felony. And uh, he felt it was a serious violation. And he was perplexed, though, because I refused to carry a weapon. So I was appealing to his humanistic side. And um, so he didn't quite know what to do. <clears throat> so he called me to the bench with attorney uh, Tiger. And he said, uh, Mr. Margolis, he said, um, I'd like you to write me a letter about um, uh, the uh, individual freedom um, the national interest and the responsibility of citizens. So I thank you, Your Honor, and I went away and after about a month or so I sent him the letter. And in the letter I told him that uh, I thought it was the responsibility of citizens um, to, uh, when the government was doing things that were against the national interest, as I felt the government was doing currently in trying to uh, um, uh, defeat uh, the insurgency in Vietnam, a small agricultural country, uh, being carpet bombed and napalmed, which is a form of terrorism from the air against the population. Um, I thought it was within uh, the uh, realm of individual freedom and the responsibility of citizens to protest what the government was doing. And that was within the national interest. Well, I think that that struck uh, Judge Bryant, and um, he uh, he put me on probation for three years, um, and uh, allowed me to continue to work at, at IPS, uh, which I thought was very uh, very generous of him. And uh, the addition to the federal courthouse in Washington is now uh, the William Bryant addition to the courthouse, and I think mm -hmm. it's a good honor for him to be yeah. so recognized. Well, now I wanted to ask you a specific question. Many of us who lived in Washington through the 60s and 70s remember you as being uh, the person who was kind of a leader and a spokesperson for um, commune building and a new kind of living that you previously talked about a little bit. Um, but could you tell us a little bit more about how it happened that you became this, uh, this leader? Yes. Well, I, I think um, it wasn't uh, accurate to say I was a leader. I think the phenomenon of, of young people beginning to live communally was happening mm -hmm. um, when I arrived in Washington. In fact, um, Carl Bernstein, mm -hmm. who later... Uh, uh, did very good work in exposing uh, Nixon uh, along with Woodward. Um, Carl did a long article um, in the Post about uh, all the communes in the city which said there were perhaps 60 or 70 or maybe 100 communes mm -hmm. of uh, 6, 7, 12 people living communally. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I think I became associated with them because I had been studying community and I was able to just articulate what I, I was observing. And I, of course I did also advocate that more and more young people live communally, but uh, I, I, I think it's not correct to say I was leading anybody. I was just speaking about the concept of it, which was that um, 
uh, from a practical and a philosophical standpoint, it made a lot of sense for young people to try to experience uh, what living uh, collectively meant in terms of developing new attitudes and new habits and new values that really uh, established a culture that was very different from the careerist, materialistic uh, culture that was so much the norm uh, and which, which we felt was so much uh, a part of the society that was waging war uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, that was denying uh, our, our African American citizens their full human and civil rights. Um, this was a part mm -hmm. of that culture and we wanted to, in our own lives, begin to change that. And uh, eventually I did, um, was invited to write about it and um, as a kind of an expression of the times, it was in a book called The New Left as symbolized by the cover of this book. Uh, this was the first uh, edition of the book. And of course, a, a year or so later, they came out with a second edition in which they toned it down a little bit by taking the red out, of, but leaving the fist. Um, but uh, uh, that was very much a part of the times in Washington. Mm -hmm. And um, you asked uh, an interesting question the other day when we talked about um, what was it like uh, to live in the 60s? Okay. And I thought I would just speak to that if I could. Um, and I think um, you know that uh, uh, there were some essential elements to it that were shared, I think, by, by many people, by most of us, even though the details of our individual lives were different and we came to it through different paths. Um, I think uh, one of the essential uh, feelings was the feeling of freedom, that we could uh, express our opinions and voice our concerns in a, in a spirit of freedom, and which, was, which was really wonderful. Mm -hmm. And that um, uh, we could have an impact by doing that, even though we were, uh, uh, had no institutional or political power. Mm -hmm. We were just citizens, young people. And I, that was a wonderful feeling. Yeah. And um, the feeling of being part of something larger. Yes. That, that, that we, as uh, President Obama said recently in mm -hmm. celebrating at Selma, um, that the word we has great power, that, that we were part of a movement of people, as we said. And the, the idea of a movement, that there was a whole group of people moving mm -hmm. uh, toward making uh, many improvements uh, because there were so many opportunities for improvement in our society as we looked around. And um, uh, we, you know, we were reading on a regular basis people like I.F. Stone, mm -hmm. who was just a brilliant independent journalist who would, who would deliver us the news um, uh, un, unvarnished with uh, the political um, confusions that we were hearing from our leaders. Um, and there was the feeling of hope, you know, that we could, we could actually uh, have an effect. And also the feeling of being lied to uh, yes. by people in authority uh, was, was, I think, a very eye-opening that, um, and this was, this was a bipartisan activity, lying to the American people both the Republicans and the Democrats. Mm -hmm. You know, Lyndon Johnson, for all his, his wonderful contributions to civil rights, mm -hmm. uh, was also uh, regularly would stand up and tell us that we would um, endure in Vietnam and we would win the eventual victory, et cetera, which we should, et cetera. This was a complete uh, fabrication and a distortion of what was in our national interest. Um, and uh, I remember when he announced that he was not going to uh, run for re-election, we were all jubilant. You yes. know, we went down to Lafayette Square. We were so happy. Celebrating. 
celebrated it. Those, those years really made so many uh, young people furious at the liberals as well as the conservatives. The, the liberal, the central liberals really lost their, their glamour in those years, you know, the, uh, because they were mostly Democrats, but they were liberal Democrats, and we had all started out, I think, feeling that we were liberal and hated the liberals by the end of the Vietnam War because they were so complicit with everything that went on that was bad. But on that thing that we just asked you about what it was like in Washington, D.C., um, I wanted to mention that um, the anti-war movement seemed to be the movement that pulled everyone together. There were many things happening. The big things were the women's movement, and the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement. But the big thing that united us, that everybody came together on, I think was the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. Um, and so there's a sense of unity about that. The big marches of the anti-war movement were really, really huge, and included people from many constituencies. Do you want to speak to that a little bit, your anti-war work, or what you thought about the, the service that the anti-war movement did, the whole movement? Yes, I, I, I totally agree with you. Because the experience of, uh, of those times was that the nightly news mm -hmm would bring us pictures. Yeah. Um, and the pictures themselves told the story of the horrors of the war. And yet the, the way it was wrapped mm -hmm. and presented by the news reporters was just completely unconvincing to us. It wasn't uh, a glorious campaign. Mm -hmm. um, it was a small country. Mm -hmm. South Vietnam was a, was a puppet government of the United States. Um, and, uh, uh, it, you know, it, we would read into the history of Vietnam and, and how much they admired, including the communists in the North, especially. Mm -hmm. uh, they admired the Declaration of Independence. Right. And they believed that they wanted to be independent. They wanted to be independent of the French. Uh, who they defeated, and, uh, and they wanted to be independent from the United States, who, mm -hmm. who they eventually also defeated. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, our leaders uh, acted as if we were on some great uh, campaign. Uh, it was just unbelievable to us. And, and this did, as you say, this did unite us mm -hmm. uh, very much uh, every day the news report would be another stitch to, to hold us together. Also, that, that last few months of the end of the war, the Saigon regime going down day by day when U.S. funding ended, I do remember that uh, at the April 30th, at the end of the Vietnam War, really the final defeat of the U.S., taking everybody out, um, there was just tremendous jubilation in Washington, D.C. People would march up to the Saigon Embassy or go in front of the White House or march down to Congress for a week. There, were, there was a celebration going on. Yes. Uh, we're coming up on the, is it the 50th anniversary of the end of the war this year. Yes. 19, and uh, yeah, 2015. 40th? What? Women, is it? 40th. 75. 40th, excuse me. No, women. 75. 40th, 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 40th anniversary. That's right, the 40th anniversary. Yeah. Um, and uh, there's going to be commemorations uh, by both the, the Pentagon and the many leaders of the, the old, the new, what we call the new left then, now it's the old new left, but uh, this spring in Washington, D.C., there's going to be both groups competing for the attention of the American people and remembering the war for what it was. So final question I wanted to ask you. Thank you for your interview. Um, uh, first, of, of all the things that you did in those years, in the 60s and 70s in Washington, D.C., which one do you think one or ones has had the greatest impact on who you are now and what you're doing now? You're a strategic consultant and a uh, clinical psychologist. What led you to that? Was it anything during those years that you did? I think I increasingly was aware that to really understand how to change culture, mm -hmm. you really had to understand psychology, the psychology of people, uh, where their, their values came from, how they were deeply rooted in their early experience, and, and also in, in the social uh, character of, of uh, the families they grew up in. Mm -hmm. And that I really wanted to 
more deeply understand uh, mm -hmm. how to deal with that and, and went to graduate school and became a clinical psychologist and also um, recognizing that, uh, you know, what a, what a deficit of leadership we have mm -hmm. and that people can get elected to office or can run organizations and communities. Um, because they're, they're suave in their ability to present themselves and speak artfully, but that that doesn't mean that they're going to contribute anything uh, meaningful to the development of our society. And so I've been very interested um, uh, with my colleague Michael Maccabee, who I've worked with for, for almost uh, four decades now, uh, been very interested in developing uh, more strategically intelligent, uh, more um, humanistically oriented uh, leaders who uh, lead for the common good and not just for uh, constituencies that uh, contribute to their campaigns. Well, thank you, Rick Margolis. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you, uh, Anne and Paul, mm -hmm. and also Mike Tabor, who's, who's not here, but who is part of this project. I think it's wonderful what you're doing. <laughs> and there are many, many people that uh, you really should interview. Uh, we'll be waiting for some suggestions from you. We have a long list of people we want to get to in the next few months, so I appreciate your your contribution. Thank good. you again. Well, okay. thank you. Okay, very good.